How we being distracted when we face crisis? How we being distracted when we face problem in life? How we being distracted when an adversity comes? And one of the good examples we have is in the life of Job. That Satan touched him in every corners of his life. Relentlessly took everything away from him and even his physical body ailment. But the best part we see about Job was he kept his faith. That was one of the strongest examples in the word of God we see. How we too when we go through difficulties in life, sometimes it's beyond our strength by giving up. Right? And this is where the distraction comes. Let's read verse 2 of Psalm 25. Give him to me and answer me. I'm relentless in my complaint and I'm surely distracted. That's the key word. He's surely distracted. When we are in a problem, we are truly distracted. Let us pray. Father, as we come to meditate your word this morning, speak to us. Lord, these are happenings in our life daily. Give us the understanding and above Lord, strengthen our faith through your word. That we will learn from your word, Father God, and your Holy Spirit will teach us and strengthen us. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we see when we are in the thick of a problem or drowning in a problem, we move far away from God. And this is not our own doing. It is the devil who uses when problems come to our life, it's not from God. Or when adversities come, it's not from God. It's from Satan. And we are his number one enemy. And many of us don't recognize it. And we don't, we, and we recognize it, and what we do, we get wallowed into it, and we give importance to it, and we give the glory to Satan. He wants to tear you apart. He wants to finish us. We don't realize that. We need to have a spiritual mind to understand this. We have seen first how to touch our faith first. Because he knows only with faith we can please God. It's very clear in the book of uh, Hebrews 11, 6. Right? It says, with faith we can please God. So he can touch the very fact of the faith that when we have struggles. The very faith to have in God. And Paul has made it very clear that we must walk by faith, not by sight. So we, when a problem comes into our life, when an adversity or crisis comes into our life, we tend to look into the problem. And we are drowned in that problem. I'm taking this thing very slowly because we are all going through some phases of life through this. My friend, learn from the Word of God through experiences. Learn that we need to be a perfect job. And the first thing the devil attacks is our faith. And he'll do our very best to give us fear. It will give us to defocus so that our faith in the Lord will be shaken, derailed, and that no longer God is there, no longer our Heavenly Father is there, no longer so what Yahweh is there. This is what the devil would like to play fiddles in his fingers upon our life. So the first thing he attacks is faith. And the second one, all right, is to disturb our worship. He wants worship to be ended. And he wants him to be worshipped. And little did we realize, we worship Satan. My friend, I repeat. We worship Satan when we worry. We worship Satan when we struggle in life. We worship Satan when we have troubled mind, when we have troubled heart. He's happy. Sometimes anger. He's happy. He's a God there. And then you can see the worst part of Christian and Christian families. We need to recognize this. We need to recognize that how the devil is playing a part and tearing apart our lives, our families. All right? Because he wants to be in control. And he wants you not to worship him. Simple as that. The irony of it. 
if you turn to Matthew chapter 4. All right, he tells Jesus, fall down and worship me. You fall down and worship me, all right, I will give you all these things to you. All right, the irony that he can even tell Jesus on his face, worship me. What are we? And he will do everything possible to stop you worshiping. Even to come to church to worship. He will do everything possible that you don't have a spirit to come. You drag yourself to come, all right, to come to church to worship. That is his doing. Right? God wants us to come together to worship. It is his command in the Sabbath that we keep it holy. But the devil wants to stop you from coming. And he will do everything possible. He will do everything possible, you know, if everything was okay with you, outside the realm of our life, he will do something possible not to come to church. Car puncture, all right, or something has come up, emergency, then you have to defocus here from church, all right, don't have to come to church, then it's important here to work for them, all right? And sometimes in an unavoidable business talk, unavoidable businesses, you know, because it's income is going to come, so forgo on Sunday, we can go. Can we see all that recognize it? And we have to recognize this very well because he wants to be worshipped. And that's the reason today you see the church of Satan. He couldn't defeat the church of God. He couldn't defeat the church of Christ because people are standing up. So he has to start the church of Satan in order to elevate himself like God. So that's very key to see how the devil wants to attack the church of God so that we can turn to him. And we are worshipping him, my friend, when we go into struggles and when we give importance to struggles, when we begin to give time to it, when we go in and, not, and, and get ourselves messy into it, you know, he's having a laugh. He's having the laugh, and the other side, God's heart is in pain that we have allowed it rather than let God be with it. So this is something that we all have to know. The devil wants the first is your faith. The second he wants to eat your worship so that you will not worship. Alright? Not just only come not coming to church. Your own personal worship. You don't have the heart to worship. Alright? I'm going through so much. What is God? Where are you? And I'm going through so much in my life. Where are you? I don't see you. All right? Some could even challenge. Lord, your word says, call upon me and I will answer you. I'm calling you. You're not answering me. Where are you? Can you see this kind of thoughts of derailing your faith? Can you see how, you know, when you're in trouble, when you call upon God, God is not there to answer you for some reason. All right? And we get angry with God. Where are you? And your word says this. Call upon me and I'll answer your rescue. you will honor you. Psalms 91. Where are you? We can question God. But God has his ways of dealing. We don't understand. We don't understand that. So today, I just want to begin the third area where the devil will distract us. The word of God. The very word that we have the Bible in your hand, my friend. You don't know the power of the word of God. If only we know the power of the word of God, we won't be sitting in, in, in a defeated manner. We won't be sitting in this manner with problem fields in our life. We don't know the power of word of God. Many of us don't understand. You can have ten thousands of meetings. You can go from Bible study to Bible study. You can do online studies. You can do everything possible, my friend. But if you don't understand the power of the word of God, the basic call, the basic. I have seen people from going from place to place for every opportunity, seminars, they attend everything. But when struggles of life comes in, they are wind down like nobody's business. You know why? What is the point of going to all these places to meeting after meeting when the word of God is not in you? Turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 15. Sorry. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 
Let's, I'll read you from verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. Alright? The first thing is that abide in me. Look at the word capital M. The word capital M means talks about God, Jesus. Alright? And it, as a branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine. If you don't abide with God, alright, in Him, you cannot produce fruit. Alright? Now the key word, look at verse 7. If you abide in me, next word, huh? watch the next word. I just told the word of God is so powerful. My words will abide in you. Alright? And ask whatever you wish, it shall be done for us. Imagine. So straightforward, the scripture. He says, if you abide in me, in Jesus, if you abide in Jesus, uh, my words will abide in you. Right? My words will abide in you. Jesus, they say, I will abide in you. He says, yes, I will abide in you, but my words will abide in you. My friend, heaven and earth will pass away. But not his word. You don't know the power of word of God. If you know the power of God, you can just go to one small meeting, one church. You are well done, my friend. The Lord will say, well done, servant. So don't run from place to place to, you know, to get head knowledges. All right, you can be filled with head knowledges. But when crisis sets into you, you wind down to the earth. Why? The word isn't there. We don't have the word. The word is not abiding us. If the word has abided in you, you won't have troubled mind. You won't have troubled heart. You don't have depression. You won't have anger, bitterness, or losing our mind. It is all belong to the devil, my friend. Satan wants it. He's enjoying when you go through this. Because we have been so distracted. Satan wants this exactly in you so that you can neglect the word of God. What is the point to call ourselves Christian when we have not abided in Jesus and His Word has not abided in us? We have our personal demands. God important? This is something that we need to ask. If the Word of God abides in you, you are a transformed person. You are a transformed person. You don't think like the people of this world. You think very differently. Your mind is different. You spiritualize things. You don't wallow into all these troubled minds and hearts, depressions. You won't go into all that, my friend. You will be strong. We need to understand. We need to learn this together. Because these days of time, we go through hard times in life. It's not easy. Struggles are not easy to manage. All right? Today you see the New Age movement comes with anger management, time management, life management. Right? All becomes very professional today. That's a, a cult. Uh, there is a clear cult. And here we have the answer so clearly in Matthew chapter 18. Very clear, the Lord says, Come to me. Take my yoke, which is easy and light, that I'll give you rest to your inner man. Where does work come in our life? But our issues become number one. And the word of God just disappears in our life. It's no longer standing there. So it's the word is there, my friend. I'll give you a classic example of what one man did. A man who walked with Jesus, who saw everything in his life. For three years he was with Jesus. He saw Jesus doing miracles by one word. He saw by one touch, you know, paralytic men could walk. One touch, all right, blind could see. He saw all that. He was with Jesus. Very sad. Alright, but what happened to him? What actually happened to him? Let's read that whole portion. That will be good for us. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 27. Okay, Matthew chapter 27, let me read from you from verses 3 to 5. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying an innocent blood. 
But they said, what is that to us? See that to yourself. Now we have seen. Now this is about Judas. Now Judas Iscariot was the one who betrayed Jesus. Now he never thought in his inkling mind that by the 30 pieces of silver they might just arrest Jesus to his mind. They might just bash him up here, whip him here and there, and they release him. That's what he thought. But he didn't realize he was actually sending, sending him to a death sentence. And so when he realized that, when he said, I have been condemned, he said, ah, in verse 3, look at verse 3, I've been condemned, and he felt remorse, and then threw the 30 pieces of silver away, and I have sinned by betraying my innocent blood. He said, I have sinned against an innocent blood. All right? Now, this is where, friends, listen very carefully. I'm going to make it short today. I'm not keeping very well this day. All right? Judas Iscariot walked with Jesus, lived with Jesus, and he saw every miracles and signs and wonders that he did. All right? And he did everything. And Judas was there to see. All right? And he saw it with his own eyes. He was hearing everything. Okay? And then he now went into a crisis for a 30 pieces of money, shekel at that time. For that money, he thought just betraying Onila. All right? They were just weeping and sending back home. But he didn't know that they're going to sentence Jesus to death. All right, during Roman Empire, cross is nothing greater. All right, cross is nothing greater. So when an evil spirit comes to take a cross and show, it's nothing. Because the Roman time, one who is to be sentenced to death is to be crucified on the cross. So Jesus is not the only person specially was crucified on that cross with two other robbers. There's not such rubbish. Just like in Malaysian law. When you are sentenced to death, you are sent to the gallows. They hang you with the loops. So in the Roman Empire time, all right, they will crucify you. Peter, one of the closest to Jesus, and after he repentance after betraying him, denying him, he repented. And when he was murdered for Christ in Rome, all right, he died for Christ. You know what he said? Please do not crucify me the way they crucified my Lord Jesus. Crucify me upside down. So they turned the cross upside down when they crucified him. So the, the cross is nothing great. And it's so sad that today everybody wants the cross in their chains. But nobody wants the Christ of that chain, of that cross. Sad. We don't abide. We want the cross. We wear the cross around. We like the cross around. So everybody wants the cross of that Christ, but nobody wants the Christ of that cross. Sad. Because we are not abiding. And so Judas is carried, fell to remorse. All right. Now, my friend, the next verse is going to hit us hard. He was there with the disciples when one disciple came and asked Jesus this. Let's turn to it. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Okay, I'll read to you verse 21 and 22. Huh? Now they all were together. Disciples were together with Jesus. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall I, my brother, sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? But Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Now Judas was right there. The point is Judas was right there. When Peter came and said, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? After the seventh time, eight times, no forgiveness for you. Okay? Now Jesus will display two things here. I'll come to it. Number one, he said, no. Seventy times seven. Now when you calculate seventy times seven, it goes about four hundred something. Yeah? By the time you calculate, you lose your calculation and we have to forgive. And Jesus said something very straightforward. There's only one sin God will not forgive you. There's only one sin that God will not forgive you. That is sin when you sin against the Holy Spirit. All other
not a sin the Lord says, I'll forgive you, but one sin that you sin against Holy Spirit, I will not forgive you. All right? And Judas Iscariot was there with Peter when he asked Jesus. Okay? When he asked Jesus, all right, now, turning back to the 27th chapter of Matthew. Let's turn to it. Now, Judas Iscariot went through a crisis. He went through struggle. He felt that he has betrayed an innocent one. All right? And he had all the opportunity. All right? All the opportunity. He heard the word 70 times 7, I must forgive. My father will forgive me for, for my sin. All right? My, my God will forgive me for my sin. Right? He could have done that. But what happened? This Judas did. Look at verse 5. Of chapter 27 he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary departed he went away and hanged himself friend the devil was right there in his heart go and die you're not worthy it's not worth for you to live your life go and die and that's what Judas Iscariot did and Judas Iscariot lost his salvation friends this is what the devil is doing. Stand, fight. You have to go through the lowest speed of your life. Stand by the word of God. And he will give you the strength or more rather. I wouldn't know how, but he will give you the strength. And Judas Iscariot picked up the moment. A man who lived with Jesus, who heard him, who talked to him, who was loving, who was compassionate. With all that, Judas Iscariot mind was blocked by his crisis, by his pain, by his troubled heart, by his troubled mind. He couldn't think straight. He couldn't think straight, like unlike Peter. <coughs> After denial, he realized he changed. All right? And God forgive him. And here we see Judas Iscariot. He was blinded by his own struggle. He was blinded. He could not think straight anymore. His mind was all boggled up. He's very full, right, isn't it? When we are going through a crisis in our life, our minds are boggled up. We don't know what to think, what, what to say. We lose our mind in talking. And this is what we go through. My friend, these are very practical things that we are going through in our daily life. Learn from the Word of God. Learn from Judas Iscariot. Everybody think by dying, over, everything is over. That's where the beginning of hell waits for you. Right? You cannot commit suicide. You don't get salvation. Right? A man who lived with Jesus today is down in burning hell. Why? Because the word of God did not abide in him. Right? Turning back to John. Let me finish that. John chapter 15. Now see this verse very clearly. It was 7. If you abide in me, my words will abide in you. Okay? When you abide in Jesus, his word will abide in us. Alright, never mind. Whatever we have done wrong, we come back to God. And when you begin to abide in him, his word begins to abide in you. The word of God will begin to strengthen you. Alright? And when you begin to Abide in his word, my friend, what he says. Ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. Right? Whatever you ask will be done for you. Why is when we pray things are not done? We have not abided in him. If we have not abided in him, if you have only abided in him, his word will abide. And the word, my friend, as I said, is a very powerful word of God we have. Many of us don't understand the power of the Word of God. Many of us don't understand the power of God. The Word of God says in the book of Genesis chapter 1, very clearly the power of God. God said it was done. He said it was done. And that's the very Word that we are having in our hand. And so, in our struggles of our life, all right, the devil wants to distract you completely. All right, distract you completely from reading the Word of God. I'm very sure 
none of you saw the, from the point that I just raised to you on Psalms to Matthew chapter 27 about Judas Iscariot. None of us even thought about it. That a disciple of Jesus hanged himself. Why? After he threw the coin, he felt most. All right. But he never went and seek forgiveness. If only Judas Iscariot would have asked God, forgive me. As I said, there's only one sin God will never forgive us when we sin in the Holy Spirit. Surely enough, the Lord would have extended his forgiveness to Judas Iscariot. He would have forgiven him. My friend, he hung on that cross. And the very first word he spoke, what? After being bitted, battered, his flesh was hanging, or disfigured, he looked upon the people and said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. What is so great about Judas Iscariot? Jesus, Judas Iscariot only betrayed him. But here people wept him, broke him, cut him to pieces. The Bible says he was disfigured. He was not a handsome body was hanging up there. Disfigured. All right, flesh were hanging with the kind of thorns which they were weeping him. All right, which was more painful. And he's, Jesus said, I forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. You mean to say Jesus would not have forgiven Judas Iscariot? Huh? Friends, this is where the word abides in us. If the word truly, 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 truly abides in us, we will be changed. We will be reformed people. We will be a regenerated people. And we will be surely be a regenerated people. We will change because the word is abiding. However, whatever you are going through, maybe the foundation right now is sinking. You may be thinking it's going to be sinking. But I will tell you this. The word of God in Hebrew chapter 13 verse 5 says, I will not leave you, neither will I forsake you. Mm -hmm. That is the promise of God if we have the word of God in us. However, the struggle goes. We don't have to be like Judas Iscariot. To land in the mental institution or even to commit suicide. Friends, I'm not finished. Next week I'll continue the next part of this particular word. How the word is powerful. How the word of God is powerful in our life. So whatever we are going through in the moments at this moment of your crisis, adversity, remember, let the word of God take a bite in you. And don't give glory to the devil. Whatever the pain he causes in your physical realm, on your physical body, whatever physical the pain he gives in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, whatever it is, the word makes no sense to us we are sitting here if the word of God does not abide in us. So let us learn together that we walk through, daily we walk through some kind of struggle, some kind of, you know, uh, crisis, some kind of adversities that come just like that. It can be in your home, it can be in your workplace, it can be in your business, it can be outside, anywhere. How do we see it? How do we perceive it? That will bring how our spiritual maturity is in the world. So friends, let me just tell this and I'll end and I'll continue next week. You can attend thousands of meetings. If the word does not abide in you, it's useless. Let the word abide in you. Stick to one little group. If you gain that word, right, and use that word in your life, right? And Judas Iscariot was only the hearer of the word. He was not the doer of the word. If only if he had doer, he would not commit suicide. If he only be the doer of the word, he would not have betrayed Jesus. If he were the doer of the word, he only been hearing, hearing, hearing. Thousands of meeting we hear. We hear, we hear, we hear. But we go into your crisis. The word has never abided in you. Friend, this is the truth. Accept it or not. This is the destiny of your life. Whether you accept it or not. I have seen people have gone from thousands of seminars. When crisis is coming, they are collapsing like nobody's business. Why? Simple. The word of God is so simple and straightforward. You have not abide in him for his word to abide in you. If his word abides in you, you will not be dwindling like this and collapsing like this. You will be standing like Job. 
Yes, he cried. Job cried. Job was in pain. He had two pain. He had a physical pain in him. All the sauce over him was painful. He was had to put dust over him and ashes over him to soothe his sores. He took a pottery and to scratch himself. The other pain was his heart. He lost everything. He lost his children. He lost everything. The second pain was there. But this man stood in his faith. That is something, a valuable lesson we all have to learn. It's not easy, my friend. Christian life is not an easy life. We have an adverse adversary. The devil is waiting to make you fall down. He's waiting to finish you off. He's waiting to prowl like a rotting lion to finish you off. Learn that. We must recognize the devil is out there to destroy families, destroy one itself. Learn so that we can able to stand on the word of God. Whatever the storms of life can come. Friends, stand on the word of God. It's just like Jesus told us a story about a house that was built upon the rock. And as the house was built upon the sand, the rain came down, the floods came up, the house on the sand washed away. But the house that was built on the rock stood still. What does Jesus mean by that? That house was standing on the word of God. He was talking about us. So friends, learn. Learn that when you abide in Him, His word will abide in us. Our God, our Father, doesn't want to see you accursed. Our Father, Heavenly God, our Jesus is not a God who wants to see you cursed. It's not from Him. It's from Satan. He wants you to be blessed. But it's in your hands. How are you standing in the Word of God? Is truly the Word of God regenerating you? Is the Word of God changing you? Or you remain the same? Is the Word of God regenerating and changing you from face to face? Or you remain the same and I will remain the same and I will be like this and I'll sit on here. If that is so, you have given yourself into the hands of the devil. You have sold your soul to the devil. Right. Give yourself, the Lord says, come unto me. He knows the life struggle. He knows our human life struggle on this face of the earth. He says, come unto me who are heavy and weary in your life, in your heart, in your spirit. Come to me. I will give you rest into your spirit. And when he says he'll give you rest in the spirit, it's not just he will redeem you. He knows what you're going through because you know what? Jesus walked on this earth 2,500 years ago as a human being. He cried. He was hungry. He was in pain just like you and me. All right, then you go before Jesus and stand and say, you do not know my suffering. The Lord said, I know what you have gone through because I have been as a human being. Friends, learn. No other God has been taken a human being to know the suffering that you are going through. He has been. It's nothing new to him. And so learn, learn God's word that we stand upon. He wants to do away Whenever you go through struggles in life, He wants you to do away the Word of God. He wants you not to turn to the Word of God. You know, when you turn to the Word of God, you don't feel like reading it because your problem is so much you are drowning in. The Word of God is no longer there. And how do you think our Father, our Lord Jesus will come and help you? Because He's not abiding in us. Next week we will continue on this same subject. As I'm not saying that I'm going very slow. All right, so that we can learn, my friend. I only pray and hope that you will not be the hearer like Judas Iscariot. Then be the doer. Let's pray.